What I really wanted to do just to kick this off was to um, talk about social enterprise. Just quickly, who are we? Uh, who's this person from Social Traders? What's this organisation? Um, my organisation um, is a small not-for-profit organisation. We are established in Victoria in 2008. We have about 12 or 13 staff. We uh, exist to support and grow social enterprise in Australia. We actually believe in the power of the markets to generate good outcomes. We are here to support the establishment of commercially viable social enterprises. We work outside of Victoria. We, work, uh, we sell programs and, and um, some of our uh, uh, knowledge and expertise to governments and philanthropists in different states, but principally our work to date has been in Victoria. Um, we do a few key things. I would define our work by these five key headings. We help people to learn about social enterprise. So we have a website that's full of information for people who are interested in social enterprise. We take people on tours. We have a bulletin. We have lots of information on the sector. We also uh, have done some basic research into um, social enterprise in Australia to capture uh, databases of all the social enterprises to the extent that we've been able to do that and to undertake some research in partnership with universities. Some of our work is around starting a social enterprise. So we do um, direct support to people with concepts and ideas that want to start social enterprises and we work intensively with them. And I'll, I'll mention one of the programs we run in a minute because it's open to people in Queensland at the moment called The Crunch. Um, and, uh, uh, but we, we, we run specific capacity building programs. We help people to grow social enterprises largely by encouraging people to buy from social enterprises. So we do a lot of work with potential buyers, whether they're consumers or businesses and government, from social enterprises. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about those products. And finally, we invest in social enterprise. And last year, we invested a million dollars in six social enterprises, and we used a mixture of grants and loans, uh, a blended finance model, um, and we, we invest in those social enterprises that we're already working with through the crunch and programs like that. So that's us, just to give you a sense. So probably a more important question that you're, uh, you know, if I asked everyone in this room, what is a social enterprise? I reckon there's about 80 of you. I'd get 80 different answers, I can guarantee it. There is no sort of uh, a universal sort of agreement necessarily around social enterprise, which makes it really difficult at times when you work in this space, particularly when you're lobbying and advocating for social enterprise. In response to that, we did some work with QUT in 2009 um, with Joe Barraquet from Queensland University of Technology. And it was a project called Phases, Finding Australia's Social Enterprise Sector. And Phases um, set out to do a whole range of things. One, it tried to understand what a social enterprise was. And once we understood what a social enterprise was, we, uh, QUT in particular went out and, and uh, did surveys to try and understand what forms they take, what industries they operate in, how many of them there are, how big they are, who the beneficiaries are, what contribution they make to the economy, trying to understand, I guess, what we were talking about when we talked about social enterprise in Australia. How many are they? Those sorts of questions were quite fundamental to the research. For the purposes of this, um, there was extensive international comparison of, of um, uh, definitions, and then it was tested locally, this definition, to see how well it worked. We ran forums up and down the East Coast, and we got pretty universal consensus that this, this was an encompassing definition of social enterprise. And it's internationally comparable, so it's quite consistent with countries like the UK and the US and Canada and other countries as well who also have social enterprises and believe in this concept. Four key elements, really important that all four are in play. One, that they are led by an economic, social, cultural, economic, or environmental mission consistent with public or community benefit. The most important words for me in that are a mission consistent with public or community benefit. They are driven by public or community benefit. They are not driven by personal profit. The second and third are, are kind of linked. They need to try, they need to trade, they need to sell in a market and a substantial proportion of their income has to come from trade. Inevitably, that suggests that over 50% of their income is from trade. Ideally, you'd have more than 50% of your income from trade because the beauty of uh, trade in the marketplace is mean that, means that you're not dependent on philanthropy or government to fill the funding hole or fundraising to fill the funding hole. And the last component is quite interesting. Reinvest the majority of their profit or surplus in the fulfilment of their mission. 
What this fundamentally means is that, that most of the prophets, are, most of, if not all, of the prophets go towards their mission. And what that means is that they don't have to be not-for-profit organisations. They're not defined by not-for-profit. They're not defined by company form. They're defined by these four elements at the end of the day. So you can have companies limited, you can have, uh, companies limited by shares that are social enterprises. You can have sole traders who are social enterprises. You can have cooperatives who are social enterprises. And you can have not-for-profits who are social enterprises. By and large, most social enterprises in Australia are not-for-profits. The other thing that came out of the research was um, there was a whole range of statistics. And if you're interested in this, go and dig up um, off our website and, or just Google phases. You'll come up with a whole range of interesting data, two that I really want to show you. One is that we sent a survey out, about 350 organisations uh, who were social enterprises responded to that, to that survey. And the breakdown of small, medium and large, as defined by the Australian Bureau of Statistics, almost mirrors exactly the breakdown of small, medium and large private businesses in Australia. Which suggests to me there are very little, uh, there, are, there, there aren't extra reasons why social enterprises can't grow that don't apply to business as well. They face the same sorts of challenges. The second chart is uh, uh, every high level uh, industry in Australia. So if you went from every business and you went to the highest level in the Australian Bureau of Statistics, you would end up with about 25 categories. And these are the top 25 categories. And out of 350 social enterprises, we had representation in every industry. And there are dominant industries in education and training, arts and recreation, social assistance, employment services, personal services, which might mean home care and so forth. So there are areas where there are more likely to be social enterprises, but social enterprises operate in every industry in Australia. And what was also interesting was that uh, in doing this research, we had a sample of about 5,000 social enterprises that we sent the survey to. We got about 350 respondents. And we estimate that there are about 20,000 social enterprises in Australia. It's very economically significant. The not-for-profit, uh, the productivity review of the not-for-profit sector uh, found that uh, 38 or 39 per cent of income in the not-for-profit sector is earned income. That's social enterprise activity that's occurring. We're talking about uh, a significant economic contribution from social enterprise. So when we're talking about these things, most people's minds lead to one example of a social enterprise. They'll go, the big issue is a social enterprise. Or they'll go, when I think of social enterprise, I think of X or Y or Z. We uh, have a basic sort of typology which breaks social enterprise down to three principal motivations. In the first bucket on the left-hand side is employment training support for marginalised groups. So those organisations who exist to create employment pathways for people who would otherwise not be in the labour market. People with disabilities, migrants, refugees, long-term unemployed, public housing tenants, whatever the cohort is. And the second group is a really interesting type of social enterprise. This is truly innovative in some ways. Because these social enterprises occur, they, they produce services and goods in direct response to community needs. They, they exist where the market has failed to provide goods and services. Or they exist where uh, people, consumers, aren't happy with the market, the goods and services the market is providing. So things like Bendigo Community Bank is an interesting example. Community childcare centres are interesting examples. We've got examples up here, and we're going to hear from one in a minute, connecting up an organisation that um, exists to provide software at below market rates to the not-for-profit sector, and those savings go into your pocket. And the third group is income generation for charitable purposes. And so these are the, these are the um, you know, every major not-for-profit organisation in Australia will have a business services arm who exists just to make money and those profits from those business services get reinvested into um, services that that organisation delivers. And the best known examples are things like the op shops, St Vinnie's, Salvation Army, you know, they run those businesses almost expressly to make profits which get reinvested back into the organisation. But pretty much every one of the big ones will have one. I worked at the Brotherhood of St Lawrence in Melbourne. We had a glass frames company called ModStyle that was a wholesaler of glass frames in Australia. It had nothing to do with the mission of the organisation. The profit is what had to do with the mission of the organisation at the end of the I day. I wanted to just highlight three examples of each of these buckets. These guys uh, are all award winners. Uh, Foresters Community Finance and Social Traders ran Social Enterprise Awards for the first time this year in May. Um, I just want to highlight three of the winners of those awards. 
who just happened to be three of the buckets that we had up on the screen just a second ago. One is resource recovery in New South Wales. Resource recovery is based in Great Lakes um, in Foster Tongue Curry. And resource recovery was established to create employment for the long-term unemployed, early school leavers and Aboriginal communities and ex-offenders in their area. They're the largest employer of uh, Aboriginal people in the region. They are a waste transfer station. They manage waste and sell it back to the community through their tip shops. They've been running for 21 years. They have a contract with local government to deliver this service. They employ uh, 22 full-time staff and 15 part-time, and they make 10% annual profit. And through their livelihood, through the function of recycling waste, they create, they are the largest employer for Aboriginals exiting the justice system in that region. That's pretty much what their social goal is of their organisation. Second group's connecting up. Needless to say, fantastic organisation. The third is Thank You Water. I don't know if you've ever been to 7-Eleven and seen Thank You Water, but Thank You Water is um, a product. Two 19-year-olds went on a trip during their gap year. They went to Africa. They were amazed by the fact that uh, 900 million people in the world don't have access to fresh, affordable, uh, fresh accessible water. And in Australia, we have taps that turn on and we have instant fresh water, yet we spend $600 million in the bottled water industry in Australia. The irony was um, confounding for them. And they basically decided to start their own bottled water, comp bottled water company where the profits from the sale of the bottled water would go to uh, water aid projects in developing countries. And these guys, as 23-year-olds, they won the Youth Social Enterprise of the Year Award. Last year, uh, reinvested to 400 thousand dollars of their profits into water aid projects. They've just gone into Coles and Woolworths, so they're about to go through the roof in terms of their profits and in terms of the impact that they can have in developing countries. For them, their measure of success is the amount of profit they drive, because fundamentally the profit they drive equates to impact in developing countries. Why social enterprise? Why not projects? I really just use this diagram to capture the fact that projects burn bright and then die, typically. Projects are funded for two to three years. They have high impact, high touch. Um, and when the money runs out, the project runs out, unless you can get it refunded. What social enterprise does is it takes a more long-term perspective. And an effective social enterprise doesn't have a, a, a vision that it will exist for three years. It has an, a vision that it exists for 10, 20, 30, 50 years. There are social enterprises, many in Australia, that have existed for over 50 years. What they often do is they don't deliver high social impact early because that would actually damage the business that they're building. They build robust, sustainable businesses that deliver social impact for long periods of time. It's their longevity that has the greatest impact. They are the anchors in the communities where they exist. So what are the characteristics? A successful social enterprise is basically a good business. All the rules of small business success apply with the added dimension of social mission. So they have a more challenging life than most small businesses have. They live and die based on the same principles that small businesses live and die based on. They have to start based on market opportunities. I can't stress this enough. If they don't have a market opportunity, there is no way this social enterprise will survive. Build it and they will come, and we see this all the time in organisations like mine and SVA, does not work for social enterprise, doesn't work for any business. So if you're applying the rules of business, you have to have an opportunity in the marketplace to be a self-sustaining business. And they succeed based on wise business heads. They do not succeed based on good hearts at the end of the day. It does mean, quite often, you have to have a different set of skills in a social enterprise than a traditional not-for-profit organisation. What are the challenges in starting and running a social enterprise? One of the challenges around capability, the capacity building with start-up social enterprises, so we look for social entrepreneurs. Every year we put a call out for social entrepreneurs, and we've just done it in Brisbane, uh, in, in Queensland. And social entrepreneurs typically don't come from business backgrounds. They can, but typically they don't. Typically they come from... Uh, uh, passionate people working in the community. That's usually the sort of profile we so see. So capability is a real challenge for some of these people because now they have to go to entrepreneurs and business managers. And I guess what I would sort of say is there needs to be a lot of investment in capability amongst some of the people who are starting social enterprise. And the point I'm making up here is that there needs to be capability before there's serious investment in startups. There has to be skilled people with, with robust, solid ideas who then become attractive to investors. There needs to be a demonstration of capability. 
The second element of this is investment. And it's linked to the first, capability. In terms of investment, social enterprises need uh, access to appropriate investment, and you need different investment at different stages. We've seen some great initiatives, and I'll talk about those in Australia in the last two years. Uh, it hasn't yet addressed the needs of social enterprises at all stages in their life cycle. At startup, you certainly need sorts of finance that are quite specific to the startup phase. And they need to be ready for investment, so they need the capability, and that's just the linkage between the two. The third area is around opening markets for social enterprise. So if you went to any sort of business, they would probably say these are the three most important elements of business. They need customers, they need investment, and they need the skills within their organisation. By customers, I think what we're really saying is how do you open up institutional buyers to social enterprise? Fundamentally, what we're talking about is small, medium organisations. That's the typical social enterprise market. So how do you make it easier to buy from social enterprises? How do you open up uh, the contract opportunities for social enterprise? And they're the real challenges that we grapple with and that social enterprises are grappling with as well. Just want to relate some of the things that are happening in each of these spaces, some of the supports and some of the successes that are occurring and some of the gaps that still remain. So in terms of capability building, what we're really seeing is, is there are, in Queensland, we've had organisations like Social Ventures Australia uh, doing capacity building, uh, School for Social Entrepreneurs running programs up here to support people starting social enterprises or um, acting as social entrepreneurs. And traditionally, Forrester's Community Finance has done work in this space as well. Just a bit about our organisation. We've created a tool that we think helps people. It's called the Social Enterprise Builder. So if you're looking at starting up a social enterprise, we've got an online tool that we've developed which is designed to walk you through the whole process from I don't really know much about social enterprise to a complete business plan. It's a free resource on our website that you can hook into if you're interested in social enterprise and particularly if you're interested in developing a social enterprise mm. idea. But The Crunch is an intensive program, six months, takes two days a week of your time typically if you're putting up for The Crunch. We link you up with mentors. Uh, we've got Accenture, uh, Telstra, Australia Post. We work with Melbourne Business School so we get MBA students. We uh, have some money to pay you to participate in those programs and basically you, you develop a, a business plan over that period of time and then you get an opportunity to pitch to our organisation and other investors uh, for the money that you need to start the social enterprise. The second thing I wanted to focus on was investment. There are investment vehicles that have been created for social enterprise over the last two years. Uh, the federal government stimulated this and there are three fund managers of, uh, they're called SETIF, Social Enterprise Development Investment Funds. Uh, one's SVA, one's Foresters Community Finance, and one is CIFA, Social Enterprise Finance Australia. But there are other sources of income out there. So in WA, the uh, state government's very supportive, and they've uh, set up a $10 million social enterprise fund. Uh, the Westpac Foundation only invests in social enterprise. They invested $3 million last year in social enterprise. And then, you know, you get typical sources of income like local government for these sorts of initiatives Opening as well. markets for social enterprise. There are a couple of resources that have been developed. This is the Social Enterprise Finder, so it's got 5,000 social enterprises listed on it. It's open source, so if you run one, you can put your social enterprise on it, but you can find out what's around if you're interested by using the Finder. Um, we run an annual gift campaign too, so we're going to run it again this year, the Good Gift Christmas campaign, so you can buy social enterprise gifts for your family. But this other area is around social procurement. I think it's probably the, uh, the greatest area of untapped uh, social uh, impact. I think social procurement is the greatest potential pool for social impact moving forward that is currently untapped. Because if you think about unlocking institutional and government buyers and corporates and starting to get them to buy social outcomes, you are unlocking a whole pool of money that hasn't been spent for these purposes previously. What that fundamentally looks like is this. It's about linking up strategic procurement, the building of roads with corporate social responsibility or government services to deliver strategic social procurement.